The Old Testament reading today is taken from Acts chapter 4. And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. But many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to about 5,000. On the next day, the rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest and Caiaphas and John and Alexander and all who were of the high priestly family. And when they had set them in the midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are being today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. By him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Christ is risen from the dead. God, God the Father is crowned him. Glory and honor. He has given him dominion over the works of his hands. He has put all things under his feet. The epistle reading is taken from 1 John chapter 3. For by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, as we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us, by the spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> The Holy Gospel according to St. John the Tenth chapter. I am the Good Shepherd, and the Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as a father knows me, and I know the father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to me, to my voice. So there will be 
one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. This is the gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Our sermon hymn, Say If You're Like a Shepherd, Lead Us. You are bought and paid for. Bought through the blood of Jesus Christ. Your sins are paid for by his suffering and death. And you have been brought to newness of life through his resurrection. Jesus Christ is risen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Yes, that's the turning point in human history. We should understand that. And today, we could call it Good Shepherd Sunday. In the time when we remember what Jesus claimed about himself. He said, I am the good shepherd. Not like there are other good shepherds, but the good shepherd. Very clear in the Greek. He has under shepherds that tend the flock, pastors, teachers, each call to do his job. And without that call, they have entered into the sheep pen through other than the door. That requires 
that they come in an orderly manner, that they address the congregation, and that they teach only what Christ has taught and nothing more, nothing less either. The shepherd that you have now, the under shepherds in the different churches, are to teach what Christ has taught me in what we have as the Holy Bible. The scriptures that have been passed down from generation to generation, written by the prophets who also were shepherds, written by the evangelists and the apostles, used by the church to teach you, to what well, recruit you, to be part of what God had always planned, you to be his sheep. You were elect. You are, as it says in the scriptures, a peculiar people, a specific people that you've been called out of darkness into God's marvelous light. That his spirit dwells on you and in you to open the scriptures to your heart. And that you are given the wonderful privilege to be connected to Christ through your baptism, where he joined himself to you. Yes, he's a good shepherd. And he's the one that laid down his life for his sheep. Notice it says his sheep. And he said, I have a flock elsewhere. That must have really been like sand in the mouth of those Pharisees that he was talking to. Are you aware that he was talking to the Pharisees in our gospel lesson today? That takes place beforehand. He's addressing. And he's talking about himself being the door through which you come into the sheepfold, which is the kingdom of God. Now, I had a a classmate in college who was, uh, he was an Arab from Nazareth. And so he let us know that. And when he got into college with us, he uh, required a test. And in that test, he wrote it all out in Hebrew. So there was one professor who graded his test that could do it in a, without a, a laborious uh, situation in doing that. That was Horace Hummel. And I remember him explaining to the class, this student, how Jesus truly was the door and what a door was from an Arab's perspective. You see, the shepherd would, or the, the shepherd of a sheep would stand in the doorway and he would make the sheep pass through his legs. And as it passed through, he was checking it all out for bugs and for tears and things that might be in it, protecting it, but cleaning it and seeing that it was clean as it went through. So he literally was a door and they didn't get in until he had cleaned that sheep up. What a graphic description of us. We don't get into the kingdom of God till he cleans us up and he cleans us up with his own blood. He doesn't let any vermin or anything like that come in with us. Now, think about when you go into the sheepfold, when you come into the kingdom of God and you live in that kingdom here and now, and that God has cleaned you up. Boy, when I start thinking about all the different things that have taken place and in my life and the people that I have known and the, the different idiosyncrasies that they had, how God would touch them and make them whole, how he's made you whole and precious in his sight through his son. He truly is the good shepherd and he knows us. I kid with the children in the, in chapel, 
And I say, he knows even the number of hairs on your head. And he doesn't have to work so hard on me as he does on you. And it's true, though. He knows us that intimately. You know, we don't deserve anything but punishment and death. And yet out of his grace, out of his mercy, out of his love for us, he died and he rose again. And we've been made clean in the sight of God. You know, I've talked with a lot of shepherds over the time because it it, it really is, is something I want to get to know better about sheep. And there was one old shepherd in Palms, Michigan that uh, told me about sheep and when they get tangled up in in brush or fall into holes and things like that and how they bleep because they need help to... and after they start bleeping they're unable to help themselves literally unable they're frozen they, they sit there and they just shake and they make noise and become weaker and weaker and weaker until the good shepherd comes and lifts them out how does that uh, work for you in your life? Isn't it the same? Without the forgiveness of Christ, without his touching us and cleansing us each and every day, there's nothing we can do. We struggle and, oh, some people cope by Worldly sorrow, that's where you feel so bad, then you feel so bad, and oh, it's terrible, and then, well, that's enough feeling bad, and you go on. But there's no forgiveness, and so it comes back and back and back. Well, then somebody may ask me, well, why do I have a memory of the things that I did wrong? If it's been cleansed away, why do I have that? And I will tell you that there are two reasons that you have that, not just one. The one is so that you don't repeat it. And the other is because you're a poor sinful being. And you may be going back to that to enjoy that sin sort of for a moment. Well, if you ever find yourself doing that, make sure you stop it immediately. Because the sin's been forgiven, and it really wasn't a good thing. Sin causes death, death in you, death in Christ, death in the Son of Man, the Good Shepherd, the one who laid down his life for you. They didn't take it from him. He met them. He gave it to them. He allowed himself. He even gave them the witness they wanted to hear, but would not hear. He told them that he was God, the Son of God, the Messiah they were looking for, and they would not accept it. What about you? Do you realize every time that we break a commandment, every time we go against God's will, we're kind of telling God, oh, well, I'm going to do it my own way. That never works. That only brings disaster. That's why he gave us commandments. So we could see how we're to live. And he gave us mercy so that we can be merciful to others. And our lives are supposed to show that we are sheep belonging to the good shepherd. That's how we're supposed to live. I mean, that's how we show our love for him. We're to learn from our mistakes. But some of those mistakes are habits. And we have to get rid of those. You see, they get ingrained so much in us then not only do we enjoy them, but they're a way of life. And we have to leave that way of life. 
you know, I'm sure you remember the story about the alcoholic who walks down the road and there's a hole there and he falls in it. And he gets up, crawls out, and he goes down again and tries to get around it and he falls in and he, he does this so many times until finally he learns to go down another street. You have to change. And if you are in a habit of doing things that are wrong, the only way you're going to get it right is to do something totally different. And it's going to take about 40 days of doing that something different before the new habit is going to take its place. There's nothing wrong with habits. But the habit might be bad in and of itself if it leads you from God. So our lives as sheep require attending. And yes, let me answer the question that Cain gave to God when he found out that God knew something had happened to Abel. He said, am I my brother's keeper? The answer is yes. Now notice that your brother, if he sins, before you go trying to correct him, maybe you should take the log out of your own eye. And then you can see clearly to help him. And maybe you'll have a little compassion for him or her at the same time. You know, Jesus, God the Father and the Holy Spirit don't see us as male and female. They all are the same in his sight. He doesn't see us as black and white or red or green. Well, maybe green because we're sick. But he sees us as his sheep. He sees us as we are without any filters. And he loves us. And that is just totally confusing to me how he could love us when we are such poor, miserable sinners. It's in our DNA. It's called original sin. It was rebellion against God. Yes, it was important because what do we do every time we don't do what God has said that we should do? We're in rebellion. That sin didn't go away. It's why we need to confess our sins and ask for his forgiveness. And he'll give it. God is faithful and just, and he'll forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But stop resisting him and stop resisting his word. Listen to what he says. Now, some of the things may seem difficult. Shoot, that big righteous is not just a little difficult it's impossible but that's not a reason for not trying to be righteous that's not a reason for asking for mercy and to see God as a being who loves us <clears throat> required that his son die for us that the good shepherd actually laid down his life for his sheep. Now, the wolf comes in and scatters. Wolves these days get a bad rap. The wolves of Palestine back at Jesus' time stood about five feet tall. They were no small animal. They were quite a beast. Some of our wolves in culture today are not so big. But then there are wolves in sheep clothing. And they go around. And they try to scatter the flock also. And they come in not through the door. And then we get some under shepherds who 
they too are sinners and they fail and we expect them not to. And every time one of them fails, the disaster within the flock is great. That's why it, it is so appalling to other pastors who are trying to tend the flock. And the punishment for that, if it does not go punished here on this earth and straightened out and confessed as a sin for forgiveness, it'll be horrid for that person in front of God. You see, there's no middle room. There's no excuses. God doesn't hear excuses. Well, we might try to give them, but they don't work. You're either righteous or you're unrighteous. You're either saved or you're not. And there's no second chance. And there's a good gap, a great gap between heaven and hell. So you can't cross over. So once lost is always lost. But lost means that you die without Christ as your Savior. So we don't give up on anybody. And you know your sin. And you know that you deserve punishment. And yet God in his mercy has seen fit to reclaim you to cleanse you as the shepherd entering into the sheepfold, to shed his blood for you, to cover you with his righteousness and take away your filth. So we certainly have something to celebrate. We have something to realize is wonderful and we have something to, well, change for. So let's change. We're part of the Good Shepherd's sheep, his flock. Let his Holy Spirit work on your spirit. Let him change you from what you have been to what he planned for you. Amen. The peace of God will pass us all understanding of our hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Let us depart in his peace. Amen. Offering is taken to support the ministry here at St. John's here in Salt Lake City and throughout the world. You are invited to be partners with us and with God in this mighty work.